Um, so hi everyone and welcome to this uh, short talk. Uh, I'm Chiara Bottoluzzi, I'm a postdoc in the Durbin's group at University of Cambridge and today I will be sharing with you part of my research on the use of comparative genomics as a tool in the conservation efforts of moths and butterflies. Moths and butterflies belong to the Lepidoptera order, uh, which is one of the most species rich order, including one, more than 180,000 described species. Moths and butterflies have important roles in the natural ecosystems, as pollinators, for instance, in the food chain and in agriculture. And at the same time, they, are, uh, they serve as model organisms in many phylogenetic and functional studies. Recent surveys have shown that Lepidoptera abundance and diversity are declining at an alarming pace, uh, and this will have important consequences on the future of many ecosystems. In the UK alone, moths abundance has crashed over the past 40 years, with three species that have become already extinct since the beginning of the 2000s. If we look at butterflies, we observe a similar trend. In fact, since the 70s, uh, overall numbers have declined by around 50%. And as I am speaking right now, half of UK butterflies are in the UCN red list. Genomic data can definitely help us reverse or at least slow down these unprecedented uh, population size declines that many species are currently going through because of the ongoing global ecological crisis we are facing. And this is because uh, the genome of these, uh, the genome uh, contains very important information on a species past demography, its genome-wide diversity and genetic load. Recent advances in sequencing technologies have definitely moved forward the fields of Lepidoptera genetics. However, for a very long time, reference genome assemblies have been available for a very few limited number of model species. With the Darwin Tree of Life, we are moving more towards a comprehensive genome assembling approach, which will finally allow us to use comparative genomics as a tool in conservation. For this purpose, we recently generated a reference-free multiple sequence alignment of 31 butterflies and 57 moths, belonging to 12 superfamilies. 76 of these genomes were generated specifically by the Darwin Tree of Life, and 12 were downloaded from the NCBI database. Genomes were selected based on the VGP assembly metrics, with a few exceptions, as you can see in the figure highlighted in red. Based on a set of alignment quality metrics that we developed specifically for this study, we classified our alignment as a relatively high quality one, where on average 10% of the Lepidoptera genome was covered. One of the first thing we look at was the genome-wide heterozygosity, and what we observe is that on average, butterflies were more heterozygous than moths. Of all the species that we had in our set, the one that particularly stood out was the cabbage moth, or Mamestra brassica, which is a very well-known pest uh, responsible for severe crop damage of a really wide variety of plant species. And as you can see in this figure, uh, which represents chromosome one, the genome of these species was almost entirely devoid of heterozygocytes. As expected, the genome-wide heterozygosity was negatively correlated with the fraction of the genome that was in a round homozygosity, so in these stretches that are completely homozygous. And this was quite expected because indeed, as higher is the number of these rounds, the higher will be the fraction of the genome covered. When we look into more details, we found that on average, 24% of the Lepidoptera genome was in a run of homozygosity. And as you can see from this figure, the vast majority of these runs were relatively short and medium in size. We had, of course, several exceptions, one of which was once again our cabbage moth, in which only 281 runs were sufficient to cover up to 96% of its genome. And as you can see from this figure, the vast majority of these runs were relatively long in size. And this means that in these species, recent inbreeding, which could have been potentially caused by a recent population bottleneck, is definitely an issue. We decided to further classify our heterozygous sites uh, based on their phylogenetic conservation score using the genomic evolutionary rate profiling developed by David of and colleagues in 2010. This approach relies on a phylogenetic tree, a multiple sequence alignment, and a neutral model that we build from 4D sites. 
We then look at every single position in the alignment and assign to each of these a rejected substitution score or called GERB score, which is a measure of selective constraint. Based on this, we define deleterious alleles as the ones that had a GERB score above five. The first thing we looked at was the potential for future inbreeding depression by simply looking at the number of deleterious alleles in each of our uh, species, because this reflects the alleles that could contribute to inbreeding depression when made homozygous by inbreeding. And as you can see from the figure, we observe a positive correlation between the number of deleterious alleles and the genome-wide heterozygosity. And once again, the exception was our cabbage moth, which was the species with the lowest number of deleterious alleles, at least in heterozygous state. We use these deleterious alleles to also look at the mass load, as was recently defined by a study published in 2022 by Bertorelli and colleagues. And by here, we mean mass load as the component of the genetic load that is made of the deleterious allele whose effect on an individual fitness is hidden by the fact that these alleles are in heterozygous state. We observed on average that moths tended to have a higher mass load than the butterflies, with once again the exception made by the uh, Mamestra brassicae, which, as I remind you, was one of the most inbred individuals that we found in our set that compared to what we expected had a relatively high mass load. So to conclude, uh, we can say that the genomic data uh, are very important because they contain relevant information on a species past demography, its genome-wide genetic diversity, and the genetic load. The results that we presented here will definitely provide an invaluable resource for future studies that aim, for instance, to use this information to forecast population trajectories under different management strategies and scenarios, but at the same time, this resource would be invaluable for future studies on population genomics on any of the species that we here presented. And at the same time, I would like to highlight that genomics informed conservation is possible, is crucial, and should be considered alongside the IUCN Red List to help the recovery of populations. And with this, I would like to uh, thank all the people that were involved in this project that highly contributed to it. I would also like to uh, thank my supervisor, Richard Durbing, and all the people from the Darwin Tree of Life project that uh, are busy currently generating these awesome and amazing chromosome level assemblies that are actually made available to you, the research community. Uh, and with this, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'm looking forward to the Q&A session.